Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the kickoff of our Black History Month events that focus on Black health and wellness. I am Noelle Payne, Assistant Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, and I'm excited to introduce Professor Andrew Fight, a professor of history and the director of the Center for Public History here at Shawnee State University. Professor Fight will discuss his latest research into the history of Portsmouth's Portsmouth's civil rights movement in the context of black health and wellness during the decades of Jim Crow, Jim Crow segregation. And while focusing on the lives of two prominent black medical professionals, Dr. W. H. Lowry and Dr. James F. Scott, Professor Fight will discuss the central role these two men played in Portsmouth civic affairs and public health. And beginning in the 1920s when, when Dr. Lowry first established his dentistry practice in the city and into the 1960s and early 70s when Dr. Scott served as as the excuse me served as as the Scioto County coroner. This presentation will be a preview of new content being developed for for Scioto historical version 4.0 an educational mobile app and website that explores the history of Portsmouth and the surrounding Appalachian region. So this presentation is being recorded, so we ask that you mute your mics and hold all verbal questions or comments until the end of the presentation. Um, however, we do encourage you to type your questions or comments in the chat form during the presentation in, ca in case anyone has to leave earlier than expected and those questions can be captured. So over to you, Professor Fight. All right, uh, thank you so much, Noel. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, to be with everybody here today and to uh, kick off the celebration of Black History Month here at Shawnee State uh, and in Portsmouth, Ohio. Um, as uh, Noel said, I'm going to uh, share some of my latest research uh, into the civil rights movement here in Portsmouth, um, and we're taking we're taking the theme of Black health and wellness, which uh, uh, was adopted for this year's um, uh, Black History Month. Um, <clears throat> so let me start by giving some background on the on the project and how this um, this research uh, dovetails with the work I'm doing uh, at the Center for Public History here at Shawnee State. Um, <clears throat> let's see the here we go. Um, so the initiatives of the Center for Public History are funded in part through the Ohio Humanities. Uh, Council, as well as the Shawnee State Development Foundation. We also have support uh, from the Ohio History Connection, which runs the Ohio History Service Corps program, which is a AmeriCorps program that ultimately is overseen by Serve Ohio. So uh, the work that that I do here at Shawnee State at the Center for Public History um, receives, uh, you know, quite uh, quite a lot of support from uh, local foundations uh, as well as federal and state uh, support. Um, <clears throat> in particular, what we're working on right now is uh, version 4.0 of uh, Scioto Historical, which is a mobile app and website um, free uh, to download. Uh, there's there's a, a iPhone version and a Android version, um, but there also is the website at SciotoHistorical.org. So, um, we received a, a grant from Ohio Humanities to develop version 4.0, so we're developing new tours. Um, and one of the new tours we're developing is on the civil rights movement history in Portsmouth. Um, but uh, we'll be developing all sorts of new uh, content, video content, audio content, uh, in general, just a refresh of the website and uh, the app design. Um, and uh, all of this will be going live uh, this coming fall. So the big launch uh, will start in September. Um, and so right now I'm, I'm working on uh, research that my students and I have been work, sort of working on over the last few years. Um, and so I'm bringing all this material together, also working on collecting additional uh, materials to, um, to help enrich our, our local history. And ultimately what the this version of Cyto historical version 4.0 hopes to do is to is to better diversify um, the history, um, the public history. Uh, you know, Portsmouth, Cyto County has a very uh, rich history of of uh, black history, you could say, 
um, uh, going all the way back to really the beginnings and of of uh, American settlement here, um, but um, the one of the efforts that we're trying to do is to is to um, make up for really what has been missing for a long time in our history, um, and that's the history of the the black community here in Portsmouth. Um, and so uh, part of what uh, we're doing here today is is uh, sharing uh, some of this new research. Uh, on topics that really have never been written up as history. So part of the um, initiative that we have right now going on is uh, uh, we're collecting uh, oral history interviews. We're also uh, digitizing uh, historical photographs and things like this. Um, and this is in partnership with the 14th Street Community Center. And I did want to mention that because uh, we do have some events coming up in March. Um, we're also scheduling oral history interviews. Um, so if you're interested or if you know somebody in, that that would would be great to interview, um, you know please please get a hold of me um, and we'll set something up. But we do have these history harvest days scheduled for March fifth and March twelfth. Uh, Those are Saturdays. Um, so look for more information on that. But we'll be scheduling interviews and also, digitizing photographs and other records uh, at the 14th Street Community Center. Ultimately, those materials will go to support uh, the interpretation you know, of the history that we're working on, um, but they also will go into a permanent online archive, uh, a digital archive that's being set up um, at the Clark Memorial Library with the Center for Public History. So uh, we'll be collecting this history and, and uh, adding it to the archive and diversifying the archive and, and improving the inclusivity uh, of the archive so that that uh, Portsmouth's rich history will, will you know, be preserved and, and uh, be made available for further study um, uh, as we go forward in time. OK, so um, what I'm going to be focusing on today is the civil rights movement in Portsmouth. And, um, you know, if you want to look at the long picture here, you can go all the way back to the abolitionist movement. Um, Portsmouth did have an active underground railroad. It had uh, um, abolitionists, both uh, both white and black uh, in the community. Um, they often worked together, um, also separate um, on the underground railroad and so forth. but. Um, you can say that the civil rights movement, you know, really goes back to the abolitionist movement here in Portsmouth as well as elsewhere. Um, but uh, we're really looking at the 20th century mo so-called modern civil rights movement. Um, and in Portsmouth, that uh, really starts to get going in the 1920s. Um, certainly, you can find stuff a little bit earlier, but Really, the modern movement begins in the 1920s. It's when you see the establishment of the NAACP nationally. You also see, I'm sorry, you see a local branch established of the NAACP here in the 1920s. Um, and and going forward, you see uh, you know various different uh, direct actions. You see lawsuits um, aimed at ending segregation in Portsmouth. Um, you see various different uh, uh, direct direct action protests ultimately you have a weighed in at the at the uh, terrace club or what becomes known as the dreamland pool um, you have a picket and boycott of the of uh, the washington school because of of it being segregated um, all that is transpiring in the 1960s um, but we're going to go back to the 1920s um, to look at really the beginnings of of this modern civil rights movement here in portsmouth and that story very much involves two doctor or two doctors, two medical professionals, uh, a dentist and a family practitioner, um, Dr. W. H. Lowry and Dr. James F. Scott. And I want to start this story um, uh, with uh, the history of a of a meeting, an organizational meeting uh, of what was known as the Portsmouth Interracial Commission. Um, this meeting was held on the 11th of August, 1931. Um, and with the site historical project, one of the things we, we have to do, and in, 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 in this is uh, we, we have to place a virtual uh, pin or like a virtual historical marker on a location on a map so that you can, you know, uh, visit these places, these historical sites and so forth. So 
one of the things that we would want to do when developing the civil rights uh, tour is figure out where do we drop the historical pins, where do we put the virtual historical markers, you know, what's the story that that's being told and where, where do you locate it? So um, what we're looking at uh, doing is using this organizational meeting of the Portsmouth Interracial Commission as one of the sort of historical locations um, uh, for telling this history of, of the civil rights movement here in Portsmouth. Um, this is a, a newspaper article that uh, reported on that meeting, um, and you'll see highlighted there that it says the newly formed interracial commission uh, meeting in the office of Dr. W. H. Lowry named the following committees, and they go through and they list the committees and who, who was appointed to the committees and so forth. But the key uh, historical information here, of course, is that the meeting was held in the office of Dr. W. H. Lowry. Um, and so this got me wondering, well, who's Dr. Uh, Lowry? Um, and uh, after some additional research, um, we were able to figure out where his office was located and also unlock uh, sort of this mystery of Dr. Lowry and, and uh, his role in the local civil rights movement. One of the things that uh, we were able to find uh, in our research um, was this advertisement by uh, CWG Hanna appeared in uh, February 1924, uh, issue of the Portsmouth Times. You see the highlighted area there is that Mr. Hanna was a uh, an attorney um, from Greenup County. He also, um, as you can see, uh, uh, had a real estate business, but. Um, it was Hannah who sold um, the home at 1013 12th Street to Dr. W.A. Lowry. Um, he calls him W.A. rather than W.H. Um, described him there as a colored dentist, formerly of Des Moines, Iowa. Um, so we've got some good data here on, on uh, Dr. Lowry, and, and it was this that really opened up the door, uh, the research to figuring out who he was. Um, it also establishes, you know, where his residence was. Um, uh, when he uh, moved here uh, back uh, in 1924. So transfers during the past week reported by GW, I'm sorry, CWG Hanna include sale of a six room home at 1013 12th Street to Dr. Lowry. Um, also want to uh, give a thanks uh, to the Portsmouth uh, Public Library and their local history department because I was able to also confirm where Dr. Lowry's office was. And it turned out that his office um, was located in his residence. Um, and so uh, in the Portsmouth City Directory, um, uh, you would see that Dr. Lowry's office uh, from 1932 um, was located at 1013 12th Street. So where is 1013 12th Street? Um, this is uh, from Google Earth um, or Google Street Maps. And uh, you can see uh, where uh, 1013 12th Street was located there. Um, basically, if you know where the, uh, the, the underpass or US 52, um, like my audio is, I think my audio is okay now, but uh, there on uh, what used to be 12th Street, um, where 52 comes through, goes under Waller Street, it goes under the railroad bridge. Um, th when they constructed that underpass and all that, um, they largely cut off 12th Street. But um, that is where uh, Dr. Lowry's residence and his his uh, office was located. Um, and thus, that is where that important meeting was held. Um, I'll get back to the meeting in a, in a minute, but let me uh, share with you about Dr. Lowry. So he, he moved to Portsmouth in February 1924 from Des Moines, Iowa. Um, he was born in 1876. Uh, he studied dentistry at Iowa State. I will say that I believe he was from Virginia, although it may have been West Virginia originally. Um, he married Henrietta X. I've got X there because I'm, I'm still trying to track down her maiden name. Um, while living in uh, Des Moines, uh, Lowry served as the vice president of the branch, uh, the Des Moines branch of the NAACP. 
So he was active in the NAACP before he came to Portsmouth, and then um, he became active uh, locally in the NAACP here in Portsmouth. The early records, I'll just say this, about the NAACP in Portsmouth, um, I've yet to really uncover uh, some really good records on that, uh, but I'm hopeful uh, that maybe there are some records in the national NAACP records, but uh, currently there's very little reporting in the Portsmouth Daily Times about the NAACP's earliest years in Portsmouth. Um, but we do know from the, the newspaper that uh, in 1926, Dr. Lowry helped establish the Portsmouth Council of Race Advisors, uh, which uh, became the Portsmouth Welfare League uh, in 1928. Um, and then in 1931, he helped reestablish this entity called the Interracial Commission. Uh, and that's that meeting that we're I was referencing. And uh, I do believe that he served as a mentor uh, to the young Dr. James F. Scott when he arrived in Portsmouth in 1930. So about this organizational meeting of the Interracial Commission, um, the attendees included Dr. Lowry, of course, also William E. Haley, and some of these names will ring some bells with uh, people in the community, I'm sure. Um, William E. Haley uh, uh, was the first president of the 14th Street Community Board, um, Community Center Board. Um, Oscar W. Pfeiffer was very active uh, uh, in many of these uh, civic organizations. Dr. Scott, of course, was there. Uh, Harry Kinney, Isaiah Tubbs, Frank McConnell, Earl Robinson, and Margaret Starks. Um, I'm sure the biographies of all these people would be completely fascinating uh, if they were to be uh, developed. Um, uh, many of them are still a mystery, a mystery to me. Um, uh, Margaret Starks, I think, is somebody that in particular de deserves some attention for her role. Um, as an African-American woman uh, being active uh, in the Interracial Commission. Um, so Dr. Lowry was uh, chosen the chairman uh, of the Interracial Affairs Committee of the commission. Um, he served on the Recreation Committee and the Aged and Child Welfare Committee, and I think that gets to Black uh, wellness uh, and, and health. And you can see that that uh, Dr. Lowry and the Interracial Commission were were very much interested in in the public health, uh, child welfare, welfare, and the health of the aged, as well as recreation, which is really a key component of wellness. Um, Dr. Scott was appointed to uh, the chairman the, to be the chair of the Sanitation Committee, uh, public health, basically sanitation. Um, he also served on what was called the Grievance Committee, and he served with Dr. Lowry on the Aged and Child Welf Welfare Committee. Um, I'll mention William Haley again. Um, William Haley was appointed chairman of the Grievance Committee and served on the Interracial Affairs Committee and the Housing Committee. So going back in time a little bit to that Race Advisors uh, Council, um, this is perhaps you could see it as maybe an earlier, uh, an earlier sort of manifestation of what would become the interracial commission. Um, it seems that that uh, there were maybe a couple different interracial commissions at at different times in the late 20s into um, the early 30s. But um, in, in in this newspaper account from 1928, you'll see that. The Race Advisors Council um, included a committee on interracial affairs, and that was chaired by Dr. Lowry. But the plans for the uh, Race Advisors Council, um, I think these are plans that you would see going forward uh, with the Interracial Commission as well. Um, but the plans for the council included a go to school campaign, benefit entertainments to be given, proceeds donated to the churches, baby clinic to be established, an annual health week observed, uh, a lecture course on the principles of American citizenship, a community newspaper, an employment and housing agency, a businessmen's association, organization of clubs and provisions made for the pleasure of the kiddies, and a movement to bring fraternal conventions to Portsmouth. So the P Portsmouth Welfare League um, 
uh, sort of grew out of uh, of these this uh, organizing efforts um, uh, of the Race Advisors uh, Council. Um, and so you, you see the Portsmouth Welfare League uh, reorganized at a meeting held in the Washington School with Dr. Lowry, uh, the head of the organization. And that's in 1928. And uh, that same newspaper account uh, about the organization, the Portsmouth Welfare League, um, it has many of the same sort of uh, committee headings uh, as you saw later for the Interracial Commission, Clubs and Recreation, Health and Sanitation, for example. One of the things the Welfare League did do um, uh, was a uh, they hosted a child health clinic. Um, again, this was uh, something put together by Dr. W.H. Lowry. Um, the plans were again made at a meeting of the Welfare League that met in Dr. Lowry's office. Dr. Lowry was uh, very active in the community, um, not not just you know with the Welfare League. Um, he was active in the Republican uh, Party. Um, he was active in helping organize Emancipation Day celebrations. So, for example, this is from 1924. Uh, Portsmouth has a long history of uh, celebrating Emancipation Day, uh, which is the 22nd of September. Um, and uh, boy, this one looked like it would have been a, a, a grand time. <laughs> Uh, the reporting here in the Daily Times uh, says that a grand march brought 300 onto the dance floor. Dr. W.H. Lowry of this city and Mrs. Blanche Cousins of Ironton leading the march. A jazz orchestra and the Elks Band from Columbus furnished the music for the dancers. Uh, Dr. Lowry was, uh, you could say, outspoken. Um, and uh, really uh, was a voice of this uh, emerging civil rights movement in Portsmouth. Um, here's an example of, uh, of another public speech he gave uh, in 1932, the rights of an American citizen, and this was delivered at the Beulah Baptist Church uh, in the North End. So, um, back to that organizational meeting and, and um, the other individual that was in that meeting was Dr. Scott that we're going to focus on. So, um, again, uh, the 11th of August, 1931, Dr. Scott has been in Portsmouth for just over a year. Um, and um, so he's sort of the new kid on the block, um, but he's quickly emerging as a, uh, a leader in the black community, um, a leader in the Portsmouth community. Uh, Dr. Scott was born in 1903, uh, so you can see he was uh, younger than Dr. Lowry, um, uh, about 28 years, I think, younger than Dr. Lowry. Um, he was uh, a native of the village of Porter in Gallia County. Um, he received his uh, MD uh, from the Ohio State University Medical School. He was the only black uh, uh, member of his graduating class, um, not the first uh, black doctor from the Ohio State University Medical School, but one of the one of the early ones um, from uh, OSU. He went to uh, Chicago, where he interned at Provident Hospital uh, for a year in 1929, and then um, he moved to Portsmouth in early 1930, uh, based upon. Um, uh, the recommendation of some family members who uh, had had heard that Portsmouth did not have a black doctor, but had a large and growing black community. Um, looking at his uh, larger, longer career here, um, he would be appointed Scioto County Coroner in September 1954. Um, he then, um, actually a month later, was elected uh, coroner of Scioto County, making him the first black elected county coroner in the United States. Um, and he would serve and be reelected uh, until 1974, uh, finishing up, I think, on uh, December 31st, 1974. Um, he also served as uh, for 10 years as the medical director of the Portsmouth City Health Department. And while he was um, excuse me, at the Portsmouth City Health Department, he established a free sickle cell anemia testing clinic uh, beginning in 1973. 
Um, he also uh, was a long uh, time member of the Trinity Lodge Number no. Nine, um, uh, the uh, Masonic Lodge here in Portsmouth, being past master. Um, I want to thank uh, Gary Hairston um, for help in uh, researching the history of Dr. Scott. Um, uh, Gary uh, uh, wrote up a, a biographical sketch of Dr. Scott back in the 1980s, I believe. Um, and um, and I've relied upon uh, uh, Gary's uh, uh, research as really a, a, a path-breaking study for me to, to learn about Dr. Scott. Um, and I want to quote from uh, Gary's uh, biographical uh, sketch of Dr. Scott. Um, Gary noted that during the early 1930s, Dr. Scott's fees consisted of $2 an office call, $3 for a house call during the day, and $5 for a house call during the night. His fees, however, were not always paid in cash. It was not uncommon that uh, grateful but poor patients would settle their obligations to Dr. Scott with chickens, turkeys, hogs, and garden products. Nice little window into the past there. Um, Gary goes on to, uh, to note that Dr. Scott was often forced to administer to his patients at their homes. This in part was because Mercy Hospital was totally segregated um, and the old Portsmouth General Hospital had only two private rooms on the first floor that were made available to black patients. During his career as a general practitioner, Dr. Scott delivered in excess of 2,000 babies. Included among them, among this number, are Ms. Uh, Kathy Battle, uh, Mr. Al Oliver, and Mr. Larry Heisel, some of the three of the more famous uh, Portsmouth natives uh, in the last, say, 70 years. So Dr. Scott's efforts on behalf of public health um, uh, can be seen uh, and found in the newspapers as well as in uh, Gary's sketch. Um, you can see that uh, in this article that Dr. Scott and M. Barber, a nurse, would hold a health clinic on the first Thursday of each month in the church basement of Beulah Baptist Church. So um, this was in conjunction with the Sunday school of the Beulah Baptist Church. Again, uh, important public health uh, outreach done by Dr. Scott. And so now um, I want to I want to tell the story of how Dr. James S. Scott became the site of county coroner, how he became the first elected uh, black county coroner in American history. Um, it's a pretty interesting story um, that really I've just uh, started to crack open. Um, but uh, you can see from this photo, Dr. Scott, uh, for, uh, says Dr. James F. Scott, coroner by write-in. At least from this report, as you can see, that he was elected uh, in a write-in campaign. Um, but originally, he was appointed. Um, and uh, he was appointed uh, by the Scioto County Commissioners um, after the uh, resignation of doc Dr. Richard Woodyard. Uh, Dr. Woodyard um, uh, gave up the coroner position to take over a private practice in Adams County. Um, so he, he moved to um, Manchester and took over a practice there uh, and then went on to become the coroner of uh, Adams County. Um, but with Woodyard's uh, resignation, it happened uh, just in advance of the November elections in 1954. Um, so the the primaries had long been uh, carried out um, and uh, because Woodyard was the only person that was uh, uh, was going to be on the ballot when he resigned um, he was removed um, from the ballot um, <clears throat> and thus there was nobody that was going to be on the ballot in November the commissioners um, were required to appoint um, a replacement uh, in such situations um, and Dr. Scott ultimately received uh, the appointment, um, but not before a little bit of drama. Um, so there was another uh, suggested uh, 
uh, I'll call him a doctor because he had a doc. He was called doctor, um, but he was uh, in the terms of the newspaper. He was a mechanotherapist, a doctor of mechanotherapy, um, and the Scioto County Medical uh, Society uh, did not consider um, <clears throat> Dr. Wolf. Uh, his name was Frederick Wolf. Uh, to be uh, an actual licensed medical doctor. Um, the the uh, suggestion that Dr. Wolf be appointed um, was never completely formally taken up by the commission uh, because a legal uh, opinion was requested uh, by the commissioners about the uh, eligibility of Dr. Wolf. And uh, in, a, in a really interesting little legal opinion that was put forward by the Saudi County prosecutor at the time, a man named William Harsha. Uh, William Harsha uh, noted that the uh, Ohio Revised Code uh, required that um, uh, that coroners, uh, in order to qualify, um, needed to have had their uh, their MD for for two years, uh, and they needed to be um, uh, uh, on good terms, or um, they need to be approved by their their profession. Um, and so, what happened was that the Scioto County uh, Medical Society um, produced a endorsement of Dr. Scott, a unanimous endorsement of Dr. Scott uh, for the position of coroner. Um, and then with the legal opinion of uh, William Harsha, uh, uh, Dr. Scott then was appointed uh, county coroner. Um, I'll note here that uh, William Harsha, for those who, who don't recognize his name, uh, William Harsha would run for the U.S. Congress uh, in 1960 uh, and win and go on to serve, I think, seven terms uh, in the U.S. Congress. Uh, representing Scioto County and the rest of Southern Ohio. Um, William Harsha was a Republican. Um, James F. Scott was a Republican. Um, and I would say that his political action and support of the Republican Party was undoubtedly critical. Um, but also, I would just say that the backing of the Scioto County Medical Society, that, that unanimous backing, um, uh, was essential. And so you did have Dr. Scott becoming um, the county coroner. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to mention here that one of the things that the the Center for Public History is doing is, uh, um, in addition to the site historical project, we have the uh, uh, Preserving Portsmouth uh, Historic Newspaper Digitization Project. And one of the things there um, that we're able to do is actually recover um, the photographic record, uh, in this case, of black history. Um, and, and one of the things you'll see from this slide is that the microfilm, and uh, some of the newspapers were microfilmed like, you know, back in the 70s or before, um, the microfilm uh, has been digitized. Um, it's behind a paywall uh, and a database. Um, but if you were to pay, you know, like $100 to access this database, um, the, the quality of the images, particularly the photographs, um, oftentimes are almost worthless. Um, and as you can see with this portrait of Dr. Scott, uh, thanks to the uh, newspaper collection here at Shawnee State, um, uh, we've been able to uh, go back to the original hard copy uh, to produce um, a high resolution uh, copy of it, and you can see what Dr. Scott looked like uh, back in the 1950s um, when he was first elected county coroner. Um, just to give you a sense of the size of this project, these are the newspapers uh, that were recently um, moved into the center here at Shawnee State, um, and we'll be working over probably the next <laughs> five to 10 years to get these all digitized, keyword searchable, and available to the public. And just another example of, of uh, how valuable and, and important these newspapers are for recovering um, the photographic record. Here's a, 
a photograph of William Haley, um, where, where you can now actually truly see what Mr. Haley looked like. OK, so um, <clears throat> moving towards the end of the presentation, I want to I want to talk about um, the dedication of Dr. James F. Scott Place and Drive. Um, and I uh, also want to talk about the location uh, of Dr. Scott's office and residence. So you'll recall uh, where the, the location of Dr. Lowry's office was. Um, it turns out that uh, after Dr. Lowry, um, Dr. Lowry moved from Portsmouth uh, to Columbus. I think his he health was failing, um, but he, he moved from Portsmouth in 1934 uh, to Columbus the same year that he passed away. Um, ultimately, Dr. Scott purchased what uh, had been Dr. Lowry's residence and office, and Dr. Scott then uh, maintained uh, his uh, medical practice uh, at 1013 12th Street as well. Now, unfortunately, if you go to 1013 12th Street today, this is what you'll see. This is a, a, a photograph from a Google Street View. Um, but unfortunately, uh, this historic home and uh, office uh, is no more. Um, I believe we're going to place the historical marker, the virtual historical marker, though, at this location because it also marks the location of what is now known as Dr. James F. Scott uh, Drive. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a photograph from the ribbon cutting ceremony back in uh, September of 1984. Um, you can see uh, Dr. Scott there with, uh, with his wife uh, on his left. Um, I believe that is Joanne A. to his right, um, um, former city councilwoman. Here's a uh, color photograph, and again, I want to thank uh, Gary Hairston for this photograph, a uh, color photograph that really captures uh, that moment, uh, the dedication of Dr. James F. Scott Place and Drive. And I'll close with this. A photograph also uh, thanks to Gary Harrison. Um, this uh, banner was uh, posted uh, uh, as part of the dedication ceremony. Doc, you have just made history in Portsmouth. So you can see that both Dr. Scott and Dr. Lowry, um, not only did they uh, contribute to uh, you know, efforts at public health and wellness uh, in the black community, um, they also would, would play an important role in the civil rights movement. Um, <clears throat> and I'll just wrap it up with this, just a, an announcement that um, uh, I, I, I will be giving a, another presentation as part of Black History Month. Um, this is for the fourth annual Black History Month Expo hosted at the 14th Street Community Center. Um, and I'll be uh, discussing my research on the history of the 14th Street Community Center, and that will be on the 19th of February at 2 p.m. And um, that is a face-to-face, in-person meeting, um, but I also will, will give a variation of it uh, virtually uh, at a future date as well. So um, I hope everybody uh, can, can either make it to that event in person or catch it on YouTube where it will ultimately be posted. So you can follow the work of the of the Center for Public History on Facebook. Um, check us out, SSU Center for Public History. Um, and uh, soon we'll have our YouTube channel up uh, where you'll be able to watch this uh, presentation as well as others. So I will uh, stop sharing my screen now and we'll, we'll open it up to uh, questions and comments. Feel free to unmute if you want to ask a question or drop it in the chat. Okay. And share video as well. We like to see faces. <laughs> I guess I just had a comment. Thanks so much for presenting so far. Um, I think it's so cool of, that there's so much history in Sayuta County and our surrounding areas. I know. 
growing up, especially throughout our high school education system around these areas, we're not taught a lot about local history. Um, we're, I mean, very glimpsed over as far as black history in itself, which is why it's important that I think we're having this conversation. But also the fact that I know at least, so I'm from Waverly, Ohio, and what I've been taught is that small towns like ours in southern Ohio were sunrise or some downtowns. But it's so interesting and so amazing to see that there is so much more history than just the negative aspects um, in our area. So I just want to say thank you, Dr. Fight, for, for sharing that. It was really good to hear. Yeah, um, you know, thanks for your comment. Um, you know, the when you think of Waverly, Waverly was known as a sundown town. Um, and, you know, it's sort of animosity towards um, black equal rights um you know goes goes back to the days of, of slavery um you know there there was a, one of the research stories i've done is is on a uh, organizer uh, for the american anti-slavery society who came down into the side of valley um, visited waverly and basically got ran out of waverly uh, by a mob uh, of people um, threatening his life and and all that his name was Reverend Edward Weed. So, uh, uh, yeah, Reverend Weed. Um, quite a quite an interesting uh, history there as well. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think we can do a lot better with our local history, and that's really what I'm trying to do. Um, I'm trying to connect American history to local history. And my experience with my students in the classroom um, has been that um, it really helps connect them to the content, you know, get them interested in it. Um, and often I get this response of like, man, I had no idea. I've lived here, you know, 20, 30 years or whatever and never heard of this. Um, you know, the, the history of the civil rights movement in our community, the black history, um, in many ways, all of our history has been neglected to some degree or another. But um, that's definitely the case with uh, local black history. I just want to address the chat real quick. Um, if you can, I'm sure you can see it now since you stopped presenting, but um, you get, you, ha you have a, a shout out from Liz Flevins and um, Luke Sarver. Luke also asked if you need volunteers to help digitize with the newspapers. Uh, yeah, we're, we're working on setting up a, uh, like a volunteer uh, program. Um, so if you are interested in, in uh, volunteering, we definitely will need some help. Um, and uh, I'll just ask you to reach out to me, uh, email me. Um, I'll put my email here in the chat. Um, and folks can get a hold of me for that. There we go. That's my email at Shawnee. So please uh, feel free to contact me. I'm going to give someone else showing their video the opportunity before I go back to the chat. I have a I have a question or a comment. Um, I'm curious. Well, first of all, this was amazing. I I grew up in Portsmouth and I'm actually an archivist in Dayton now, and I don't think I've ever seen or heard a presentation like this about my actual hometown. So I'm just I, I can't. <laughs> but um, I was curious if in researching like the um civil rights you know stuff if you've encountered anything with other ethnic communities and the thing that made me think of this was when you started talking about uh 12th street um my family was italian and they all lived right you know down there 10 11 12th my great grandfather lived about two blocks east of the address you were talking about mm -hmm. um, and my grandfather had a store in the late 30s that he called the equal rights and i don't really know anything about that other than I've seen a picture of it and that's what it said but I don't <laughs> interesting I'm just curious um, you know the I did recently come across um, when I was working on Dr. Lowry um, I, I, I came across a newspaper article about um, a a home that a homes, I think it was on Waller, but it was over there, sort of 12th Waller, that area. 
that had been raided for being disorderly. And um, uh, what struck me about it was that um, they arrested like 20 people uh, and and a, about half of them or more were Mexican. Huh. Uh, and we're talking about the 1920s. Hmm. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, when you, when you want to talk about like uh, lost, forgotten, uh, you know, uh, neglected history, um, the history of the Latina, uh, Latino Mexican community in Portsmouth is really like terra incognito. Um, and, and, you know, so now I'm thinking, well, it must go back to the twenties, you know, if not before. Um, and, 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 you know, so there's so much history to, to still be, um, sort of unearthed, you could say. And, uh, and the immigrant experience in Portsmouth, um, Italian immigrants, um, you know, that there was a large German immigration, of course, in, into Portsmouth that shaped its history, um, as well. And, um, you know, but but uh, yeah, lots of lots of work. There's a, <laughs> there's a very very a uh, lot of great opportunity, I guess I put it that way, for historians to um, to work on this material. Thank you. You're muted, Lauren. Are you trying to speak? Okay. okay. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying. Right. I I don't know. Um, Dr. Drew personally, but um, my name is Lorna Ferguson. I'm originally from Portsmouth, Ohio, and thank you for doing this. I had the privilege of attending Washington Elementary School. Um, I am related to George Farley. Um, also, I think I told someone about um, Ross, and I will talk to Dr. Drew about that. There was a street named after my relative there between 13th and um, 12th Street, and he was, he, I think he was a councilman um, also, but um, I do want to thank you for bringing this to attention. I wish you were in Portsmouth when I was going through school, but um, like I said, I grew up in the North End, and um, like I said, fortunate because we did have Black teachers, and some of them were my relatives, and that's where we learned about Black history and then I also in undergraduate I I attended um, Central State University where Dr. Um, Wesley and um, we called them all Robinson they were the first to write um, to write about um, black history books which I have a copy encyclopedias I don't know if you knew about those but we do you know on that so I was fortunate for that but again I want to thank you he is my Facebook friend. I have never met him. He did work with my cousin, um, Orville Ferguson. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just want to thank you for this. Well, uh, thank you for uh, for being here today and, and for all your support. Um, and, you know, you're I've come across your family in, in my research, you know, a number of times. And and uh, the Ferguson's really, uh, you know, we're we're really key key players in the community and at the school um and for the civil rights movement uh, i would say too so um it's good to have you on, on our call today thank you thank you and like i said it brings happy memories but also sad memories because i can i can tell you some things like like i said i grew i grew up when you know it there was segregation and we knew exactly where to go and not not to go. Mm -hmm. yep. Oh, um, go back to the chat. Um, Sarah Diamond Burroway, she said, thanks for sharing the stories of these two outstanding citizens and your research moving forward. Do you anticipate building a repository with additional stories of black people and their roles in helping um, industries like healthcare, teaching, police and fire services? Um, such important roles in um, is nurturing in a community. Uh, yeah, I sort of mentioned this in passing that that the North End um, initiative that we're doing with the 14th Street Community Center, the the oral histories that we're doing. Um, I mean, we are 
this at this phase we're focusing on the history of the center and and uh, some of the civil rights um, related history uh, and locations um, you know like like the Washington School um, and McKinley Pool um, and of course um, Dreamland um, but we're I would just say in general we're you know our goal is to record oral histories and collect uh, historical photographs and other things like that document the history of the community and all those facets um, and you know this will be uh, open to the public on a digital it's called the digital commons uh, at Shawnee State it's hosted by the Clark Memorial Library um, but uh, we actually have some material up right now that was done by Ohio State University's Folklore Field School Dr. Cassie Patterson uh, helped organize that and and we've archived their materials uh, on the digital commons. Uh, so we are sort of building that that um, you know digital archive uh, along the lines of what Sarah asked about. Anyone else chant that's muted if you have any questions or comments or want to drop something in the chat? I just have to say, and to put it on perspective for me in the 20s, when you talk about how huge that event was, the dance, and how hard it was to communicate at that time, you know, with, with a lack of technology, it's hard enough these days with the technology we have to get a lot of attendance for events and things of that nature, but back then, um, it just amazes me that you had they had that big of a turnout. Yeah, I think the that particular Emancipation Day celebration was um, was large um, because they coordinated with um, some of the other towns like Ironton, and it was that one was organized by um, and this was something I just learned is that there was a there was a, a Black Elks uh, club like a segregated version of the Elks uh, in Portsmouth. And Dr. Lowry, Lowry was, was, was very much involved um, uh, in the Black Elks. Um, and so I think that some of the planning that made that possible, the difficulty you're talking about, you know, like getting people from different cities and, and having all the bands and all this stuff um i think it was facilitated in this case by the um the network of the of the black elks that makes sense because there's still those organizations today that are, are mostly black especially in ironton there's mm -hmm. organizations um that i'm familiar with from on my my, my dad's side um right. that still attend they're still heavily involved so i can see where that networking um really works that way mm -hmm. I'll say William Haley, um, and I'll say more about Haley at my next presentation because he was the first president of the 14th Street Community uh, Center Board. Um, but Haley was um, was a, a state inspector of barber shops, um, and what that meant was that he traveled a lot, like all around the state, um, and that was also, I think, key to some of the networks, like the. Um, some of the state level organizations um, that that were African American, but but you know, uh, being a state inspector just meant that he traveled all over the state and and he interacted with all the different local chapters and organizations and things like that. That's, I'm glad you brought that up because that's where my mind was going. If they would probably have to physically go to those locations and have those additional discussions for organizing something mm -hmm. of that magnitude mm -hmm. yep anybody else have any questions or comments go ahead lisa i have one more question um i know you saw i saw a lot of newspaper articles and you mentioned uh gary was it hairston uh, and the directories. I was curious if you've found other like 
manuscript collections that are helping you with this research or? Um, um, well, I'm really relying upon um, the newspapers. Um, okay. uh, unfortunately, the, um, you know, the local archives, um, I guess I'll put it this way, they're largely white. Um, and, and like the photo collections, for example, um, there's a wonderful photo collection called the Ackerman Collection at the Southern oh, yes. Museum. Um, I worked on the bicentennial exhibit that they did, and I went through the whole collection. Uh, we're talking about like 10,000 plus photos, you know. Um, and um, I, I, unfortunately, I, I could find very few pictures of the black community, um, you know, in the collection. Um, and, you know, it's just a reflection of of the segregated communities, really, mm -hmm. um, from back in that time. And the Ackerman collection, you know, goes from he started collecting in the 1950 or 1940s and up until the 1990s. But in his photos go all the way back to the 19th century. But um, very, very few photos of the black community. Um, if you if you recall in my presentation, I mentioned that the Council of the Race Advisors Council, when they were laying out their proposal, the things they were going to do, one of them was a community newspaper. Hmm. And William Haley was the editor of it, and it existed. But I have not been able to find a single copy oh. of it. It's, it's from the 1920s. It was called um, Color, the Colored News, and it was it. It, it was renamed the pilot. So sometimes oh. sometimes it's referred to as the pilot or the colored news. Um, and, you know, I know it existed because I, I've, I've seen reference to it in the Portsmouth Times. Um, and um, a couple other places there's references to it. But uh, mm -hmm. so I mean, my hope, right, would be that it's there's a cop there are copies out there somewhere but you know the reality is is that the 1937 flood you know just devastated the north end every single house was underwater all of the residents had to be evacuated so you know i hate to say it but i i'm afraid that that copies of that newspaper are gone and we probably won't ever get them back but you know if if I was to offer a prayer <laughs> to Cleo, <laughs> the the muse of history, right? Yes. That, that somebody collected those and passed them down, and somehow they're just waiting to be discovered. The Holy Grail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I'm sure there are essays, uh, editorials by Lowry, by Haley. I mean, um, I will mention that that um, the Cleveland call and post newspaper um actually uh has a lot of portsmouth material in it and it was a black newspaper published uh in cleveland that basically reported on the whole state um and uh jean haley uh, william haley's wife had a regular column in the call and post called i think it was called portsmouth news or something like that um and and so there's a run of uh, it's kind of like a social, it'd be like the stuff that you would gather from like Facebook today, you know. <laughs> so and so's visiting with so and so, and so and so's in the hospital, and so and so graduated from Wilberforce, you know that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but you know it's just those little tidbits that you know you sew them together, and then you've got a quilt, you know. So. Um, so yeah i mean th that's i guess that's what it, what uh those are the collections um uh, but you know the oral histories that we've done and that we're doing i think also um will will prove to be very helpful um in telling the story and preserving the history you're in a good position to sort of make your own archives of <laughs> what can still be collected which is right awesome. mm -hmm. yeah. thanks you have a, a thank you from Jenny Richards uh, for moving to the community and making it yours and uh, thanking you for bringing um, so much passion for telling the truth. Oh, 
Well, thank you, Jenny. I appreciate well said, it. Jenny. Well said. Um, I also miss Liz's comment about um, this story is a big missing piece in the 200 years of caring book that they worked on in 2001. Ah, yes. Um, the 200 years of caring is a, a, a book um, that was produced by the Southern Ohio Medical Center um, looking at 200 years of, uh, of uh, health care in Portsmouth. Um, and um, yeah, um, I, I, I don't recall it, you know, uh, exactly, but I know, I know what you're meaning that, that, that it, it would, uh, it would be a chapter that would help round it out for sure that is missing. Yeah. And, and, you know, we, we relied on, um, hospital records and, um, um, particularly Mercy Hospital, the um, Sisters of St. Francis had a lot of really nice photographs and, and, but, you know, I've never heard this particular story and it's, it's, you know, it, it, when, just when you think that everything has, you know, been out there enough to where people can find it, you discover something new. And when you first started, I was like, I don't remember those those names and anything that I saw. Um, mm -hmm. We also relied on retired nurses and retired doctors to, mm -hmm. you know, bring in their own collections, um, which we did, we did discover that that's how we kind of pieced together Portsmouth General and um, um, Sider Memorial Hospital, um, some of their history. But yeah, this is a huge missing piece and it would be nice um, to kind of revisit that whole healthcare history. Right. Yeah, I really appreciated that the theme was uh, health and wellness because it, it really allowed me to sort of put a, a lens sort of in front of me to then look at the material in a new light um, and and really kind of think, go beyond simply their, um, you know, their role in civil rights history that, that I was initially focusing on, um, you know, the public health aspect of, of their roles, I, I think, you know, has not been fully appreciated. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, I, you know, I was struck by the, I guess the program, you might say that the, the committee, the different commissions and committees were, were looking at doing, it's, it's what the 14th Street Community Center does, um, you know, and and has continued, you know, continues to do is you know provide a space for clinics and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's it's a, uh, I guess, forgotten history or maybe forgotten is not the right word. Maybe it's just hasn't been written up. Um, you know, and so I'm 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 honored to 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 have to have this work to do. Um, you know. Um, uh, you know, my original interests uh, were on the abolition movement uh, and the anti-slavery movement. Um, that's what I worked on in my dissertation for my PhD. Um, and, you know, I, I knew when I moved here that that, that history was here. Um, I didn't realize how much of it had not been written up. Um, and, and so I found the Underground Railroad history to be just incredibly rich as well, kind of like, like this history is that it just never was written up. Um, and, and, and so that's the case with, with, uh, black wellness and, and health, you know, that history has just not been written up in our community. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad to be able to do it. And we appreciate you doing it <laughs> immensely. Um, we were a little bit past time, but I just want to make one comment of just, and then another thing that relates to me um, that's very relative to the time is um, not being able with ancestry. You know, you, it's rare for us to go back past 1900. I can't go past 1901, which my great grandfather was born. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of that history is lost. So um, and that's within the archives of ancestry. So you got to really physically go to those locations and dig up in those libraries. I hadn't had the opportunity to do that yet. But um it definitely hits home that that lost history that you're trying to reclaim. Um, it's much appreciated in any format that relates 
to our community. So, you know, I just think it's important that we get it out there into the public and it's not just in some journal where, you know, academics are the only ones that read it and then maybe it gets incorporated into like a, a lecture somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or might maybe get referenced in a magazine or something, you know what I'm saying? Um, so, uh, I mean, the, the Center for Public History, that's what we're dedicated to is getting this history out to the public and to ultimately diversifying the public history of our community. Drew, uh, Dr. Fai, I just wanted to extend my thanks on behalf of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Shawnee State. I wanted to thank you for sharing all of this information. When we heard your presentations a few weeks ago um, to several community members, we knew that we needed to have you a part of uh, Black History Month, but even future events just to continue to raise awareness. And I also want to extend my thanks to Noel and Marlita Cadogan and, and Jacob Smathers for organizing today's event. It's it's evident that um, it's necessary. Um, a, a lot of this we do not know about. Um, so we just we continue to thank you and look forward to future sessions as well. Well, thank you, Melinda. Appreciate that. Absolutely. I was going to say to be continued, right? <laughs> and the Scioto historical app that Dr. Fight mentioned earlier, if you have not downloaded that, please do, because there is a lot of great information there as well. It's a, it's a great resource. Thank you. All right. With that being said, well, I appreciate everyone for attending this event. Um, Dr. Fight. So much gratitude. I just can't verbally express it. Uh, I'm sure everyone feels, a lot of people feel the same way. Um, and we look for your next session. Um, we do have more events this month for Black History Month, each Wednesday, three more Wednesdays of this month. So tune in. If you need, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me at npain at, at shawnee.edu. Um, or we have our um, Office of DEI email at dei at shawnee.edu. Um, we also have that communicate on social media and through emails internally. So, but yes, reach out and we'll gladly give you as much information as needed. And we just thank you for attending and being engrossed in this content as much as we are. So thank you. We'll see you next time. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.